They're unusual and extraordinary, not just for what they say, but for who they are. My name is Keith, and I'm also a little page you. Joel Castell, Gary Prodden, and Tim Thompson. Five inmates from the D.C. jail running tomorrow for an open seat on D.C.'s Advisory Neighborhood Commission. Can we stop with the whole, the white man holding us down, it ain't nothing I can do in this country, I'm oppressed. Can we please stop that though? This don't look like oppression when brothers in jail can run for public office. I've been to a few of the neighborhood advisory commission meetings in different neighborhoods that I lived in. And man, I tell you, man, I tell you, man, they do some big work in those neighborhood advisory commissions. They determine the amount of pol police patrols, whether businesses coming into the neighborhood can get liquor license, whether, you know, some building can be deemed historic and thus can't be torn down or, you know, different things like that. Potholes, where there's going to be construction, whether there's people getting permits for, 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 for building buildings. They do a lot of the stuff that's responsible for your neighborhood in these advisory neighborhood commissions. This is not the level of a city councilman, but this is the level right below a city councilman. And you got brothers in, in jail running for these positions, black men in jail running for these positions. So please, please, please stop with the oppressed we oppressed the white man holding us down. Ain't nobody holding you down. They paying $15 at McDonald's now to flip burgers. Salute to these brothers for showing you brothers on the streets. You Negroes on the streets ain't even running for these positions. You thug niggas on the streets. These thug brothers on the streets is running around carjacking people and knocking old people upside the head and stealing grandma's purses <laughs> while well, you got these thugged out brothers in jail running for public office I don't want to hear nothing else about no oppressed nothing Joel Castell, Gary Prodden, and Tim Thompson Five inmates from the D.C. jail running tomorrow for an open seat on D.C.'s Advisory Neighborhood Commission. My platform will be used to restore the dignity of incarcerated people that we will no longer be judged by our worst mistake. The ANC is the most local form of D.C. government, and there's a district here representing the jail, the Harriet Tubman Woman Shelter, and a few new high-end apartments that have never had a rep. I'll be dedicated and advocating for improving city services, to manage neighborhood improvement programs, and monitor resident complaints. Inmates at the jail, most of whom are awaiting trial or serving sentences under one year, are allowed to vote. The Department of Corrections recorded these Kennedy videos, but what hasn't been worked out, how will inmates respond to constituents? As much as we can, we take emails, we take letters. You hear what the brother said? They'll take emails and letters. They can communicate. They can do email. These brothers could literally, in jail, in this oppressed country where a black man on the street ain't got a chance because the color is his skin, these brothers in jail have everything they need to actually fill this position. These brothers not saying, man, well, I'm in jail, so I can't do it. They can literally do this job from jail. That's how much freedom and access to the outside world and communication they have in jail. I don't want to hear about oppression no more. I'm tired. Do y'all understand? One of you here feel me on that. I'm tired of hearing about oppression, man. We oppressed, man. The white man got his foot on our neck. And it's always some rich guy. It's, it's either Oprah or LeBron or Colin Kaepernick, somebody who's rich who made it in all this oppression, always telling us that we oppressed. And then you got brothers in, in jail 
running for public office. And not saying, man, out of jail, I got a disadvantage, man. I can't do the same job as somebody outside. They like, look, I can do it. Just give me the chance. Wow. Their platforms range from more accountability within the jail to greater mental health services. But they all envision a district where every voice matters, every concern is heard, and every person is valued. D.C. convicted felons are also allowed to vote while in prison thanks to a new law signed late last year by Mayor Bowser. Mike Valerio, WUSA 9. And what do you know? That brother right there won. He won. He's the new neighborhood commission. Advisory neighborhood commissioner for that area, the jail, the woman's shelter, and a couple apartment buildings over there in that little area. <laughs> Ain't that something? How did the white man not hold this brother back, man? I don't want to hear nothing else about oppression, man. I'm tired of it, man. A new, get a new talking point. We need a new talking point because we always got to be whining about something. Everybody complain. People love complaining. Everybody complain. I complain about stuff. Everybody complains about stuff. White people complain about stuff. Black people complain. Asian people. But black people, we need a new talking point, man. <laughs> oppression getting old, man. You ain't being oppressed, man. Stop it. This brother won. And please don't try to take away from they only did the, they he only the, the, they let him do that. They trying to they they, they trying to do they doing that so they try they don't want to let high value men listen man. Don't take away from this brother's accomplishment, man. Okay? This brother in a white supremacist country where everything's against him. Look, he's in jail. He survived the arrest. You're supposed to get killed every time you get arrested, right? He survived the arrest. You give him, can he get credit for that? And now he's the damn D.C. jail inmate. ANC board commissioner. I don't hear about the Illuminati letting jail brothers win these positions. They, they, so that they, they, they would, so that black, the high value men will look bad and they, 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 and then they, they want us to see the, the, look, he ran for it, he won. You out here in the streets and you knocking old ladies upside the head, taking their purses. Okay? You out here in the streets then got a $100,000 PPP loan and still ain't got nothing. And you broke down with a new wardrobe and a, and a car that ain't even all the way paid off. <laughs> about to get, about to go where he at. So just get his brother his credit and let's move on. Well, this primary day is very special for Ronald Whitehead of Portsmouth. First of all, he turned the big 5-0. And for the first time, he exercised his right to vote. Today, New Science Regina Mobley has this small step on primary day, but a really a giant leap for Whitehead, Regina. Yeah, Anita, a little more than a year ago, Ronald Whitehead was in prison on drug charges. He got hooked on heroin as a teenager and is so grateful he survived as the drug scene has claimed so many lives. Well, tonight, thanks to the governor, Whitehead is having his voice heard in the Democratic primary. Shortly after the polls opened, Ronald Whitehead, with his new bride at his side, was a little nervous as he entered Lakeview Elementary School. Chief Officer Kim Artis was on hand to walk him through the process. What I have here is your voting rights and responsibilities. His road to the polls was a long and dangerous one. Heroin addiction landed him in and out of incarceration for decades. You think this brother's sitting up on a Friday night <laughs> at 10 o'clock waiting around in some 
YouTuber's chat room. Ready to hear about how he's a high value man and what he got to do to get women. <laughs> and how he got to talk all tough to women on the first date and tell them they fat and he ain't going to take care of their kids. <laughs> Before he even smash. <laughs> Watching glitches pop up on the screen. <laughs> Now, on Friday night, this brother who just came home from prison is in, in the house with his wife. Probably having a candlelight dinner or watching a movie with his wife. When I tell you Pookies be winning, because cause that, that whole high value crap y'all listen to, that's going to have you lonely. Eating pizza bites with half empty bottles of Hennessy and blunt guts in an ashtray on your table and a mattress on the floor in a dirty bathroom. Pookies be winning because they know the game. The game ain't about telling her she fat and you ain't going to take care of kids on the first date before you smashed. And running around proclaiming how high value you are. I would tell y'all the game. I have told y'all the game. I have a three-part series. How to be the thug she loves without ever going to jail. Because the brothers, the, the thugs, the homies, the pookie, the ray rays, they got the game down. That's why this brother has a beautiful wife. And he just came home from jail and he been hooked on heroin all his life. And you got 25,000 lonely dudes in some chat room talking on YouTube talking about their high value every night of the week. Instead of being on a date with a beautiful woman. 11 o'clock at night. You on, every night you in some damn chat room talking about how high value you are. How you got time for that? Why you ain't beating them off with a stick? Shortly after the polls opened, Ronald Whitehead, with his new bride at his side, was a little nervous as he entered Lakeview Elementary School. Chief Officer Kim Artis was on hand to walk him through the process. What I have here is your voting rights and responsibilities. His road to the polls was a long and dangerous one. Heroin addiction landed him in and out of incarceration for decades. But everything changed in 2017 when he met his future wife and gave his life to Christ. And when I found God, a lot of things changed for me. My lifestyle changed, my attitude changed, my compassion for people changed. So it can be done. I'm a living witness. He spent three years in prison and was released in May of 2020. He got married, opened a pressure washing business, and on March 24th, 2021, Governor Ralph Northam restored Whitehead's rights to vote, something he had never done before primary day 2021. Kind of lost for words right now because like it's my first time, it's my birthday, so it's a lot on me today, so... Uh, it's just a gorgeous occasion. Whitehead will return to prison, not as an inmate, but as a messenger. And I encourage all the black young men, such as myself, and other ones that's been incarcerated, you got to persevere, you got to keep your faith in God, and he'll bring you through it. You'll be at a situation or the point where I'm at now to where you can vote and be a productive member of society. His family is so proud of him. Whitehead says he would like to meet the governor personally and thank him. So far, the governor has restored the rights of more than 69,000 convicted felons. What this restoration means for Whitehead and others coming up at 6. Regina Mobley, 10 on your side. And another case of deadly domestic violence is in court this week. Ronnie O'Neill III is accused of killing his sometime girlfriend and his nine-year-old daughter in Riverview in March of 2018. He's also accused of stabbing his own son at the time, who may now testify against him. Eight on your side's Jeff Patterson joins us live from the courthouse. And Jeff, we understand that O'Neill plans to act as his own attorney. Is that right? Good evening, Stacey. That's right, he is acting as his own attorney in this case, despite multiple warnings from the judge. He is expected to claim that he killed his girlfriend in self-defense and that she killed their daughter. 
This was the scene in Riverview in 2018. In video obtained by Eight on Your Side, first responders can be heard screaming at Ronnie O'Neill before tasing him outside of his home. Wait a second, they didn't kill the brother? I thought every brother had an interaction with a cop got killed. Hold on. My producer's in my ear. You mean out of the 17,940, I mean in 85 police departments? So there's 17,985 police departments in this country? And only 14 unarmed black men get killed a year? Even though they're responsible for 80% of the murders and 70% of the violent crime committed in the entire country while only being 6% of the population? That can't be right. All right, guys. Yeah, my producer bugging, man. He just told me some... I'm not even going... I ain't even going to relay that to you because it's ridiculous. <sighs> This was the scene in Riverview in 2018. In video obtained by Eight on Your Side, first responders can be heard screaming at Ronnie O'Neill before tasing him outside of his home. That morning, O'Neill's girlfriend called 911 begging for help before she died. What a great country before she died. Even though the brother shot her <laughs> to death before she died, like she just had a heart attack. But look at this beautiful woman. This brother, this psycho goon, goony, straight goony, career criminal. Look at this beautiful woman here. You think this brother's on 11 o'clock on a Friday night? Watching some man in a candlelit dark room talk about how high value he is. Nah, he just out there. Banging the cute broads, banging the fine broads, banging the fine sisters, man. Banging them. He got one to, you know, have a bunch of kids by him. Name them all after him. Yeah, things went bad because, you know, they usually do with these guys, they, they're violent criminals. But the attraction, they allow, they know how to create attraction. They know how to do things. It's, it's not that the girl like bad boys necessarily. It's the things they do. And you not learning it. <laughs> well, y'all ain't. Y'all ain't learning it. I, I, I've watched a few episodes. Y'all ain't learning That morning, O'Neal's girlfriend called 911 begging for help before she died. In the background, a man believed to be O'Neal can be heard screaming Allah Akbar or God is great in Arabic. In a separate call, O'Neal told dispatchers, I've been attacked by some white demons. Her name is Kiki and she tried to kill me and I killed her. First responders also treated an eight-year-old boy at the scene and later learned it's O'Neal's son who had been stabbed and burned. The child is expected to be a key witness in this case, testifying that O'Neal shot and killed his mother as you know you have the right to represent yourself you also have the right to have counsel represent you o'neill is insisting on representing himself at trial after his public defenders refused to use a stand your ground defense hillsborough judge michelle cisco warned o'neill several times today that acting as his own lawyer is a bad idea again i'm going to um, tell you that there are many potential disadvantages and pitfalls to representing yourself. Jury selection is expected to last the rest of the week. The entire trial could last up to three weeks. Stacy. So, Jeff, any problems with O'Neill representing himself today? Not today, but today is about as basic as you could get. Basically asking potential jurors if they had any conflicts with the case. Tomorrow, the questioning of the jurors is expected to get a little bit more complicated. And of course, as we moved into the trial, there are many legal hurdles that somebody who doesn't have a law degree is going to experience. He does have public defenders standing nearby at other tables in case he finally asks for help. Boy, including he could potentially have to question his own son about this horrific incident. All right, right. Jeff Patterson reporting live in Hillsborough County. Thank you. The evidence is going to show.
This is the first impression jurors received of Ronnie O'Neill, the Riverview man charged in a gruesome rampage that killed his girlfriend, his young daughter, and nearly killed his eight-year-old son. O'Neill, representing himself, shouted at the jury during his opening statement. And the evidence is going to show! Look at the judge face. <laughs> like, I warned you! This ain't going to work, man. It wasn't going to work anyway. You was going to get convicted anyway. The evidence is, there's a mountain of evidence against you. Video, your own statements, DNA. Your son survived the attack. First thing he told the cops was you did it. So you wasn't going to win anyway. But great country we live in. Great country we live in. Brothers beat murder all the time. I think a lot of you square people on here that talk about how racist the system is and unjust it is. Y'all ain't never been in the system. Y'all don't got homies. Y'all squares. And that's cool. That's great. That's great to be a square. I'm half a square. I wish I would have been a whole square. But brothers beat murder trials all the time. Brothers beat tri charges all the time. The reason there's so many brothers in jail because they throw boulders at the penitentiary. They don't just throw pebbles. They throw boulders at the penitentiary. That's why it's a lot of brothers in jail. Now, whatever minuscule chance he had of somehow beating this case. I mean, it's over, man. You, you basically took the tact of you going to intimidate the jury. So you ain't kill your wife or your kid and stab the other kid, but you in here trying to literally intimidate the jury, like on some street stuff. Okay, that's not going to work, buddy. The judge told him. O'Neill, representing himself, shouted at the jury during his opening statement. And the evidence is going to show But the state says evidence is indisputable that the only person responsible for the violent attack on his family is Ronnie O'Neill. And it starts with a 911 call from Kenyatta Barron, O'Neill's girlfriend. She made that call with fear in her voice. <laughs> Kenyatta can be heard pleading for her life. Prosecutors say by then she'd already been shot. And while the recording continued, they say O'Neill can be heard beating her with a shotgun. The evidence will show that that was just the beginning. That's just the beginning of what happened this evening. Investigators say after killing Kenyatta, O'Neill brutally murdered his nine-year-old daughter, Ranivia, and tried to stab to death his eight-year-old son, also named Ronnie, before setting him and the house on fire. And it's just the beginning of what became an odyssey, an odyssey for this little boy. An odyssey of violence, an odyssey of brutality. The little boy, however, survived the attack, barely. But the words that came out of this little boy's mouth were not a cry for help. They were not a help me or a painful cry. They will tell you the first words that came out of this little brave boy's mouth my daddy killed my mommy. The evidence is going to show my son did not see me murder his mom. The evidence is going to show he did not see me shoot his mom. And Ronnie O'Neill has indicated that he plans to argue that he acted in self-defense. Meanwhile, his son, Ronnie the Fourth, uh, is expected to testify in this case. Right now, he's 11 years old at this point. This happened three years ago. And uh, he is going to testify in the coming days. Chris? 11, year, 11 years old and, and saw things as an 8-year-old that no one uh, should ever see and will now be on the other side of possibly putting his father away for life or more. Uh, a lot to come on this trial here as it just gets underway. Aaron Mesmer live for us in Hillsborough County.